my biggest actionable tip right now is we all know that time is money and that I'm a big advocate of systems equals freedom. So to that end, I'm currently working on three ways to do that, which is make sure I have five-star guest communication which means it's automated. I'm also making sure that I get my tech stack in place, which is dynamic pricing, property management system, guest verification, all of that. And then the last thing is develop a set of standard operating procedures. This is the Fit Investor Podcast, where we talk about how to live a more holistic life of being fit, not only financially, but physically and faithfully. We'll be joined by experts in all these areas to share their experiences and actionable and practical tips so that you can be a fit investor too. So now let's join our hosts, Kale Delaney, Wesley Whitehead, and Brenna Carls. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of The Fit Investor. I'm your host, Kale Delaney, here with our fearless co-host, Brenna, the bullfighter, Maples. (laughs) And uh, today we have a very special guest, Laura Wegner. And Laura is actually uh, another featured author in the Hospitable Host 2 book. So if you haven't picked that up, make sure you pick it up and you can read all about her story. Yeah, but Laura is the founder of The Sweet Life, which is located in Whistler, Canada. Canada. She's a businesswoman, investor, persuader, encourager of hopes and dreams, and a majority shareholder in four successful companies. As a Sweet Life, she offers a modern one-bedroom designer-inspired spaces, boasting both style and comfort. And these premium ski-in, ski-out properties are especially suited for couples looking to unwind, decompress, and blaze their own trail. In fact, out of a 1,000 listings, Laura's one-bedroom property has been identified as the fourth most profitable in Whistler, according to AirDNA, which is pretty amazing. Wow. Sweet Life's purpose is twofold, offering boutique spaces and one as an Airbnb management company that supports and educates investors who want to build out their portfolio through maximizing their ski-in, ski-out properties' revenue potential in Whistler. Well, you, that's more, right. You've got a lot more going on than that, which we're going to unpack, though. So, <laughs> Laura, yes. thank you very much for joining us. And actually, just to start this off, which I didn't even I didn't tell you this yet, even, but uh, you actually are one of the reasons that we got this podcast started because oh. really this idea of floating around for a long time and never really took action, and then Laura and I had met at the book launch event that we had for this book at a conference in Nashville. And Laura was the first person that came up to me and made a comment about how I had spoken about my faith in my chapter and how she was appreciative of that and asked to pray for me with her husband. And that, and I had a couple other people come up to me after that with similar things. And when you did that, it just made me think, okay, people do want to hear about their faith, about people's faith. They there is a space right. for wanting to bring that into this. Yes, room. I agree. So I love that one. Just really quick, like asking somebody if they can pray with them or pray for them. That's huge. You don't hear that often, or it might take somebody like a lot of guts to do that because you don't know somebody's response. So I, I really admire that. Yes. Oh, we are part of the prayer team <laughs> at our <laughs> church. So we pray for majors all the time. But we do really have a heart to come alongside people and encourage them where they're at. And a lot of us, when we're struggling or we have difficulties or even in the winds, right? It's so nice to have someone stand beside us in agreement. And that's really what prayer is all about. And just speaking that light and life into our heart in Christ. I think that's really a beautiful thing. And so I'm... Thank you for sharing that. I had no idea, yes. but those that was a heart moment. And I really did appreciate what you shared in your chapter. And I really identified with life isn't perfect. It doesn't always look the way that we think it's going to look. But at the other side, victory is always still sweet. No matter what people go through, when you see them on the other side of that, you just think, wow. And I was so inspired by your story and your perseverance and your heart and your focus. That's a huge thing. Thank you. Hey, I appreciate that. <laughs> Let's talk about you. This, this, oh, is about- this is about you. <laughs> I do appreciate that. Thank you very much. 
<laughs> so let's talk about your, let's, let's take it back. Okay. You started as a teacher. Yes. Let's start from there. Let's go okay. through your journey and your career and how you eventually came to becoming the sweet life and offering those. Okay, excellent. So I started as a lower elementary school teacher on the big island of Hawaii, just taught in some really rough schools. And I loved every moment of it. I loved the kids. So I taught kindergarten through third grade. Anybody out there who has children in the K through three, those are my peeps. <laughs> I just love their sense of humor and their zest for life. I'm the youngest in the families and I tend to be very dramatic. And maybe that's from teaching the younger kids, but that's really where I connected with them. And I love information. So to take a science project and distill that down to the least common denominator for a younger student, I love that. I really have a passion for that. And uh, it was amazing. I would go and teach in the morning then I would get my surfboard and go out and play in the waves with my students cool. afterwards sounds wonderful very marginal surfing technique <laughs> <laughs> I dominated the cakey section I always say that cakey is kids so all where all the kids surf I dominated the cakey section anyway and then from there my life really unraveled I don't in particular want to go through every detail of it, but it really unraveled. And I found myself in a place saying, what in the world am I going to do next? And so one of the things that I was really praying about and thinking about was a career change. That's how I shifted from being a teacher to going into the field of linguistics because I knew that there were language groups out there who didn't have an alphabet or written form of their language, or they had certain texts they wanted translated, but they didn't have a written form. And I thought, I could do that. It's just like education. When you get an education, nobody can rip that away from you. So I had been through a time where I was just stripped of everything. And I thought, oh, I can go and do that. And nobody can ever take that away from me. And that's what I love about teaching. That's what I love about education. And that's what I love about linguistics. It was a way to still give back to communities and, and do something pretty fantastic and exciting and new. Yeah. Linguistics is intense, though. It's crazy hard. And I didn't know if I could do it. But I thought, you know what? I'm just going to go for it. And I excelled and just loved it. I worked in Papua New Guinea on and off for about six years, climbing mountains with a backpack, being dropped off in a helicopter. Really? It was, it was the land of the unexpected. <laughs> Did you have to have a special degree for the linguistics or just? Yes. Okay. Yeah, my master's. So I went back to school to get a master's in linguistics. Okay. Wow. And how did you even come across linguistics in the first place, though? Was it something you'd had an interest in before or just popped in your head? Or like that? There's a nonprofit organization that was dealing in the field of linguistics. And I thought, I really want to do that. I, like I said, I had lost everything and I thought, okay, <laughs> I have nothing. And I'm just going to go and give back. So that was it. I knew that this was a, an organization that gave back. They cared about communities. They cared about communities that didn't have resources and served them anyway. And hmm. so I thought, okay, I'm going to do that. And I'm going to have a life experience that I would have never have had. And I'm so grateful. I <laughs> met some very amazing people and have more stories than you can even imagine. I was going to, is there a quick story that you can think of that from that time or that you spent at Papua New Guinea? Is that one of those unexpected things that happened that you could share? I know I'm putting you on the spot there. No, there's quite a few unexpected things. So here is a very exciting story. So each time we would go out to do a language
survey, which is what we were doing, trying to figure out who speaks what language, we would, there would be a leader of the group. And so I was the leader of the group. And there's five other people with me. We're in an outrigger canoe going down the river. We get to a village. We spend the night. And the next morning, we're going to take some linguistic data. We're going to make recordings. We're going to write down information. And then all of a sudden, I'm in a hut. I'm asking the questions of the people around me. They were teachers at the time. So I'm asking them about the school. And all of a sudden, I hear really loud yelling and metal clanking against metal. I People start getting up and running. And I think, what I should get up and run. So I got up and I ran outside to take a look. And they had knives and machetes. They had this big fight that was going on in the middle of the village, something that happened. And I had to get all five people out in that boat and out of that village before literally war happened. So in New Guinea, what happens is they don't take anybody to court. They have village justice. And that's really how they settle their arguments and stuff like that. So that was a very exciting, tense moment. But I have to say, one of our questions is, when you argue, what is the best language to argue in? Tokbisin, which is the national trade language, or the village language. And they all told me the village language was the best to argue in. But when they were fighting, I turned around and said, what language are they speaking to the translator next to me? And she said, Tokbisin. And I said, I thought so. So... You always have to confirm, just like with investing in real estate. You get so your like, numbers, in, you get your information. Getting those people to the canoe, was it like you were going out the back door and you look like Johnny Depp, like running on the Pirates to the Caribbean? Or was it like, just like this very calm, it was, like we're just going to walk to the boat and I can just wave and act and like was, we know what we're doing. There was a bit of a hot shuffle going on, Perhaps, right? Yeah. Shuffle. So <laughs> I would be sprinting to the boat. I would be like, yelling, Jesus, I would be trying to walk on water. Yelling in English, the best language to give directions in for me <laughs> and getting them to the boat. And at least we could tell too linguistically that if there's a clash between two clans and we're going to do some literature for that particular village, we need to make sure that they get along and accept that particular dialect that it's being printed in or they won't use it. Mm. So that in itself is actually helpful for us and very exciting. I can and then just a quick question on the canoe thing. Yes. It's just fascinating to me. Did you have somebody that was like native to the area that was taking you to the water? Absolutely. To these places or you, were you? Okay. So you had somebody that was. Right. So to- if you're ever going to visit Papua New Guinea, that is not the kind of place that you would go out out by yourself. And that's because they have village protection. You know, I don't think you do that at all. It's a great place to explore, but you need to do it in the context of relationship. And man, which is powerful. I can only imagine all the stories. It sounds like a super exciting time. And you said you did this for on and off for six Six, years. Six years. Yeah. That's really cool. It was amazing. The entire time the focus was, was on Papua New Guinea? Yes. Okay. Wow. Right. The whole time. And the people there, I just told a wild and crazy story, which is one little village in the middle of so many other villages, but they are of people that are very gracious mm-hmm. and quick to laugh, very musical. They love to sing and really experts in their environment. So mm-hmm. people would always ask me like, Oh, are they backwards? And I'd say, no, I'm backwards there. (laughs) They are experts in their environment. It almost sounds like mission work. I know it's not like missionary where you go out from the church and stuff like that, but it sounds like we're supposed to live a life to for God. And then you're there and you're helping all these people like literally create an alphabet to a language. And then, but while you're trying to serve them, they're also serving you by teaching you so many valuable lessons that Absolutely. I really love the PNG people. If I could tell you how many hands I've held and just had moments of insight and inspiration and appreciation 
and what it means to be a host, right? Because when we would go into the villages, they would extend hospitality to us. Mm. And some people have limited resources. And it's just really a beautiful thing to see at the village level, what does hospitality look like? So that's, I'm glad you brought that up. That's always something that I find so intriguing and so interesting and why I think travel is such a wonderful thing, especially right. in intercultural That's travel, right. is two things. One is you made the comment of people asked you, hey, are they backwards there? The more you travel, the more you find that everybody is really the same, right? right. Yeah. Different That's ways right. of living and different ways of doing things. And, and right. But at the heart of the matter, everybody is really the same. We all have similar passions and desires, mm -hmm. right? And, more often than not, people are hospitable and friendly. And so right. you can, any of these countries that are dangerous countries that yeah. you're warned against going to, if you actually go there, the majority of the people are probably going to be some of the friendliest people that you've ever met. Absolutely. That's right. always been the experience in my traveling and why I think I love right. it. And not only that, but you mentioned the hospitality factor and seeing what hospitality in its probably in its raw essence, looks like, right? From people who have limited means, oftentimes those people are the most hospitable people too. I mean, it's just, it's very interesting. I want to totally I put in on preface. So whoever's listening to this, if you're young and I say young, like you're just getting out of college and you want to explore the world. Yes, you hear about countries being dangerous and stuff. And Mokhail says most of them are nice. You definitely shouldn't go by yourself. So I'm just putting that. Laura was with a lot of people that knew the area. She was That's right. pretty secure. Don't, by any means, don't go to a country you know nothing about because you will probably get yourself into a pickle unless you are with people, other people. So I just wanted to throw that out there. If knowledge, knowledge is power. <laughs> I don't want the impressionable people to be like, I'm going to go to New Guinea by myself. No, don't do that. <laughs> Thank you. Right. I have to understand the culture there and everything too. So. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Good, good word there, Brenna. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, just getting back to the hospitality thing and maybe we can tie that into how that's impacted and helped shape your, the hospitality that you now express and give with your business. Ooh, uh, that's so interesting. Yeah. I'm sure there's things that you learned and things that yes. you did and adapted from your experiences. I'm going to say that my assumption going into some of these villages was that their resources were a bit limited, but their imaginations weren't. Mm. And so therefore their hospitality oftentimes was very extravagant. Mm. And by that, when you come in, I went into a village and they're like, oh, do you want to try sago grubs? And I think, okay, they have to go out. Now you're like, <laughs> see your face, Kale. <laughs> they have to go out, hunt them down. I'm sure they know where they are, get them. Bring them back. And th that's not, it's not like you what is at corner market. Before I get lost, what are you, is that a, a, a worm? It's a grub, yes. It's a, like grub, it's a okay. chupa stage of a sago animal. <laughs> there, will, there will be some Googling going on. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so they asked you if you wanted to try one. And then to go and get it and bring it. Or would you like a coconut? go out to the, it's not like they're going to go pick it up. Oftentimes they see that they climb the tree and get it. Would you like fish or whatever it is? They go out and spear right. it. So I call that extravagant. Yeah. I don't know if they were in our homes, if we would be so inconvenienced. <laughs> and I'm, I just am really grateful for that hospitality that the people of Papua New Guinea extended to me over yeah. and over again and our team. I yeah. think it was definitely extravagant and it does play a role in, and also in Hawaii, right? I think the Hawaiian people are the most, mm -hmm. the most giving extravagant hosts probably in the whole entire world. Yeah. And so between Papua New Guinea, so we have Malaysian cultures here and Hawaii, you have this, for me, about 20, more than 20 years of experience of people extending this beautiful, heartfelt hospitality extravagantly. It didn't matter if it, they had resources or not, but just that plays into 
how I host people because my friends in Ohana in Hawaii and also in Papua New Guinea, that was tailored to me. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's very important to stand out and curate stays for people, tailor experiences for people, elevate their stay in the same way that my stay was elevated really across the world, not just in P&G, but those are really great lessons to understand, oh, all it takes is a little bit of forethought, the desire to do it, and the follow through. Do you have any gifts that have been like unthankful and really wanting stuff? And if so, how do you deal with that? Because a lot of people like, okay, I can order groceries on my phone right now if it wanted to be delivered to my house. And so a lot of people think that's just the way the world is, but it's not. Like Mm. there's, like Mm. you just said, they have to go out and catch whatever they eat. And so if you realize that like you're a small little like ant in this universe, does it, from what you've seen and experienced, if you get like an unruly or ungrateful guest, does that affect you? How do you deal with that? Ooh, that's a very good question. I'm relatively new to the industry and I can tell you, I don't know if I've just gotten people who appreciate the generosity that we extend. I can honestly tell you, I haven't had a guest like that. I think that I could, of course. I don't know how exactly I'm going to respond. I hope I respond well and that I show up well for that conversation. But I think at the end of the day, I'm not extending generosity because I expect them to be grateful. Right. I'm extending generosity because it's a position of my heart. And whether they're grateful or not is not a prerequisite for me extending that. However, I can tell you, I'm a words of appreciation. Yeah, it's a five love languages, words of appreciation person. So if someone says to me, hey, I really appreciate you did, that really does mean something to me. And I can tell you right now that most of my guests have been very vocal about appreciating that kind of hospitality extended to them. But I do know that things happen. I don't know. You should do one. You should do one property and make copies of all like your pictures and stuff that you've had from like New Guinea and all these places that you visited and put it in there. Maybe like post like a little framed picture of like your story or something. I think that would, I would love to stay somewhere where like we could see all this. If you can't physically go there, it's really neat to see somebody's story and pictures. Okay. But I don't know. Just thought. <laughs> I always think I'm the only one interested, but I think that's good encouragement. I'm going to really think about that. Now, what, like you mentioned, like your hospitality includes having forethought and not expecting Mm -hmm. anything in return for what you do. Are there any kind of examples you can give of maybe something that you think you do differently or over and above what other hosts may offer? I'm still learning what other hosts are offering. And I'm still learning how to have a very unique interaction with my guest. Can say this. I always say the difference between us and them is us. <laughs> so I think the foundation of all of the hosts out there in the whole entire world that are doing well, the very foundation of that is that it's us and our personality and what we bring to the table. That is the start because. I'm going to rebook with you, Kale, because I know you and I like you and I like my experience. And so that laying that as the foundation, the things that we do that are unique is, and that I'm trying to get in place as well, regular things that are not unique are probably just like a gift basket, something like that. If they're celebrating a special event, making sure that there's something in the suite that recognizes that, like a Mylar balloon to the gift basket handwritten note, but a lot of people are doing that. My way of setting myself apart is curating those experiences through relationships in the area of Whistler. So right now I'm trying to build a network of artists and there's a lot of Olympians, like professional athletes. Wouldn't you like to ski with a silver medalist or a gold medalist? Some people really want to do that. With somebody who's a mountain bike expert 
who's gotten awards all over the world for their mountain biking prowess (laughs) or somebody who's been a famous artist in Whistler or BC to be able to sit beside them and have an art lesson. Those are the types of things I'm trying to build right now. I can't give you a list of things that have been done because I'm, I'm trying to build those experiences for people and find out what do people want. So right now I'm basing that on my low level is this. Someone said to me, Hey, I'm going to bring my 10 year old on a mountain bike excursion and we don't want to do any black runs, maybe just green, maybe some blue. And so literally I hopped on my mountain bike. I got Google maps and I went around our favorite trails that we do with somebody who was about that age range. He was able to take the map, put it on the trail and follow it along. No problems. That was done just for one guest. Wow. And they really loved it. I love the technical trails in Whistler. So that was easy for me. But that type of thing, going mm-hmm. above and beyond in that way. Yeah, that's awesome. And man, I'm like, I'm so jealous. I want to come to Whistler right now. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I need to ski with an Olympian. I need to try the, I need to try the bunny hill with an Olympian. <laughs> <Spear>. <laughs> Did I do, do it, Brenda? Do it. You? you can do it. That's that's the biking fun. sounds really cool, though. The biking does sound cool. So you say you bike? Oh, yes. I love all of that. The skiing and the biking. My husband got me into that. I grew up surfing because you just buy one piece of equipment and you can go <laughs> every day, right? That was my, started that in high school. But skiing, for me, I was like, ah, the resources for that. And then mountain biking. So he loved that. He got me into that. Whistler. Is the most amazing ski hill and it's gorgeous and it's world-class. It's voted best ski resort in North America. I don't know how many years running now. It is world-class and it is gorgeous and it is my happy place. (laughs) Wow. One day, one day I will visit. Come, I will give you the extra special treatment. (laughs) We put on a podcast. There we go. Right. We'll do four. Do, do, yeah, exactly. Yes. We'll it's so it wonderful. Business expense. Yes. It, that would be awesome. Man, we'll have to think about that. <laughs> uh, Lots of things to do. Yeah. So <clears throat> I know we, we jumped right into the short-term rentals and stuff just because it was a natural segue from the hospitality there, your other experience. But before we get off the finances, I do want to take a step back and just find out how did you get into the short-term rentals? Because we left off here. Right. Traveling the world, backpacking, jumping out of helicopters, right. he had, biking, all of a sudden, skiing all with stuff. Olympians. <laughs> now, yeah, now you're skiing with Olympians and being a hospitable host. So just take us a little bit of a step back and how did we make that transition and what was that like? So after I came back from Papua New Guinea, I ended up starting a gourmet coffee service business here in the Lower Mainland. And I was in offices, like your typical like real estate, law offices, accounting offices, and some of the Costco's in the lower mainland too. They were saying they weren't taking any more vendors there. And I was able to get in there. I was so grateful. And then COVID hit and my coffee machines were in places where people weren't meeting anymore. Mm. And It wasn't even a slow and painful death. It was a quick, violent, horrid death. (laughs) Jeez. (laughs) And I realized very quickly, I'm done. And I wanted to build it up and sell it. I had that all, my exit plan set. And then COVID demolished that plan. And just about three months prior to COVID hitting, we had purchased the suite in Whistler. And so honestly, that was the only game in town. And when we had crunched the numbers for the suite, we had looked at it as a possibility for long-term rentals, but everybody was going back to their home country. So there's a lot of people coming into Whistler to work and they were all going back home. So then I thought, how's that going to work? Like (laughs) even the long-term rental plan, that's, how's that going to happen? But I thought, I'm just going to try this. I'm going to 
see if I can make this work, see if this could be profitable, see if I can defy the Whistler odds. <laughs> and I was very grateful that we, people were bugging. <laughs> I think they were Define trying to- these, Were these properties you purchased or did you build them? These were, the, I have one property and so they were purchased. Okay. And Whistler has two very distinct markets in the condo segment is phase one and phase two. So anybody who's listening out there who wants to invest in Whistler, stay away from phase two. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Those are what they call hotel condos. And you get 28 days in the winter, 28 days in the summer, and ownership is a bit sketchy. <laughs> that sounds like a timeshare. That's my, it's really like that. It's not, in my opinion, a great investment. But phase one is freehold. It's just like any other condo you would own. And this particular building has like amazing ski valet and you have a bike valet. They have underground parking structure. They have the largest mm -hmm. pool in the bench lands and three hot tubs. So it's really well run and our real estate agent helped us get all the numbers to that. And then I confirmed those numbers with property management companies in the area. And I said, hey, what do you suppose this suite can generate? And then I took all of those bits of information to confirm that it was a good buy and we're so grateful. So when you ski the bunny hill with the Olympian, Yes. And then go into that nice hot tub or the largest pool, whatever you're choosing. Depending on your skill, you might be able to ski from the hill and fly right into the hot tub. I'm not, no, not me, not yet. <laughs> but no, in all seriousness, I want to back up some and say, I see this recurring all the time. So I just want to just emphasize to you guys that are listening, just because something that you enjoy doing or you started out doing doesn't work out doesn't mean that you are failing because you it's there's I've never heard I've never met somebody who was like I tried this it didn't work out there was nothing else for me to do in my life and so now I have nothing to do right. there's nothing like the, there's always certain you're always growing and learning no matter how old you are and so just because your coffee endeavor didn't work out you went to this you took your hospitality background to these short-term rentals and now you're thriving in that. And so it's like people that are listening never think that because you've started something and it's not really what you thought it was going to be or it's not working out doesn't mean that you're going to find something else that enlightens you and it's your new passion. That's a great point. The whole failing forward. We <laughs> talked about that with another. <laughs> on skis, on the, butt, on the bunny hill. Yeah. Yeah. As long as you, as long as you can learn from that failure and pick up the pieces and put that into something else instead of getting stuck in the rut, which I'm sure can be very easy to do. Yeah, it's, it's an inspiring life that you've led. And I wish we could go on for more yeah. on, because yeah. honestly, I feel there's so much. I can get your contact <laughs> information and call you on a weekend and yeah. be like, all right, <laughs> talk. Let, let's Tell hear me about your life story. Here you go. <laughs> and I also just want to add, sometimes it's just time to walk away. Mm. And I think in the Western, I say Western culture because I'm so used to traveling North America. In North American culture, maybe European too, just letting go and saying that's done and pivoting and moving on. I think that's really knowing when to do that and when to move on to the next thing is probably the most important thing that you learn in life. Starting from you playing with someone on the playground and they don't play nice. Maybe it's time to play with someone else who plays nice with you. You're dating someone who it doesn't work out. Well, it's time to move on from that. You purchased a property that you maybe made a mistake on. Maybe you cut your losses and you take that money, put it elsewhere. I don't know, but I do know that it's so important, Brennan, what you're saying, that those things aren't looked at as failures. But it's, it is a very important part of the journey. And uh, I love being able to learn from that and understand, okay, this is what I know moving forward. I have my own business. I don't want to ever work for anybody else. Whatever it is going forward, I know it's going to be my own business too. 
that I knew the rest of it could just fade away. Yeah. And I don't want to get off on the tangent, but it's something that I think about a lot, the education system and at mm. least in the US, I'm sure in many Western countries, failure is taught as a very negative thing. And I think that's why people get True. stuck in that rut and not wanting or not being able to let go of something because we have it ingrained in our minds from the very beginning mm. that you cannot fail. If, if you fail, fail, you didn't try hard enough or something like that. Yeah, you didn't try right. hard enough, you are a failure, right? So it's, I think that's a very important thing and that is very difficult. That is a very difficult thing. So yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. In the spirit of moving on, <laughs> let's move on to our next section here and uh, let's talk about fitness. So we've already heard you're doing the mountain biking, the surfing, the skiing. <laughs> I'm so interested in the surfing. I've always wanted to learn that. So <laughs> what, is, yeah, what, else, what else do we got? Let's talk about this here, Laura. Okay. Kale, you're going to be, you might be a bit disappointed. I love to be outdoors and very outdoorsy. I love to do all of those things outside. I am not the best gym person. And we do have one of us, a small Bowflex unit in our loft that we use. And I do, I do a seven minute workout, Kale. Yep, that's right. <laughs> I have a nap, seven minute workout. And uh, some days I ask my husband to keep me on track with my seven minute workout. And he's like, did you work out today? And I say, no, honey. And he's what? Couldn't find seven minutes. Seven yes. minutes. You too will have a six tech abs yeah. if you work out seven <laughs> minutes a day. Okay. <laughs> but yes, so I just want to be all out there. But what I can say is that I'm very active in other things and I choose to do outdoor things. Maybe it's walking, hiking, biking, love to explore. Regular fitness, I try to do that two or three times a week. But you should ask my accountability partner. <laughs> Is that your husband? Yes. He's the one who's not impressed with my seven minutes. But <laughs> he, so seven he, minutes more than you were like... I, mean, I know. I like the outdoor thing too. Like, yeah, it's. I, yeah, I, I think that's even more important. The whole, yeah. the whole point of <clears throat> fitness is doesn't have to be going to the gym like I do. Being outdoorsy and doing biking, hiking. Frankly, I think that's better. In, in this, I think when you're being active, I think there's different levels. Obviously, I think right. being intentional with your activity yeah. and doing things and pushing yourself, you're yeah. not just going out for a a lazy stroll. Well, that's better than nothing. Yes, it uh, is. <laughs> but <laughs> so we're not, when we create this fitness, we're not talking about kale, six pack abs or whatever he has. We're talking about getting out there and just moving. And whether mm. it's walking, like I feel walking or hiking is, brings the most joy personally. And maybe I feel like you're in the same way, Laura. It's like mm. you're thinking and it's like a meditative, like you're meditating at the same time because you're taking in all the nature, you're having your along with Definitely. your thoughts and stuff, but you're still keeping that body moving and right. that's i think that's the biggest factor in being wellness basically mm -hmm. instead of the word fitness if that makes sense okay Ooh, i really like that go brenda yeah i was a little nervous there kale i was like on instagram i was like kale's working out oh kale's working out kale's taking six kale, kale. i promise you i, was like, I will have I six like and up so but i eat cookies okay i eat cookies. i like <laughs> oh my gosh, i feel like i had two desserts last night like <laughs> I just tried to figure out, but okay. So just wanted to be up front with my everything in mod everything in moderation. No, again, I if I was it, I'm in South Florida, and again, some people look at South Florida as a paradise, but for me, it, it's I grew up in the mountains and things like that. So I love biking and that type of stuff, and there's there's just not that opportunity here. Right. And so for me, there's not a whole lot of outdoor activity that I right. enjoy here. Okay, it's too hot. Yeah, <laughs> just, that's true. You know, go to the beach, but that's not being active. So for Maybe me, if you try to run in the sand, have you ever tried to run in the sand? Uh, yes, but that it's is fun. <laughs> <laughs> the enjoyable outdoor activities. I'm not a big water sports person or something right. like for people. Or in the winter time, because it gets cold up there. So in the winter time, do you ski? Is that we do you ski or do you snowboard or ski? I ski. ski. It's so funny. I surf, but not able to really snowboard. <laughs> I get, <laughs> I get, I get really I cloffed. Yeah, I don't like my feet. Being in one thing that's mm. stuck, I, I don't like that. I think the reason why I ask you is because I tend to get a little bit of seasonal depression in the winter time because 
I love being outdoors. Mm. Also, like a chihuahua and I like get cold at the slightest breeze. And so I really love to get out there and do more winter stuff. So what's your advice to listeners to to even get out in nature during wintertime? I think it's fun if you can have someone to do it with. If you can't, I spent a lot of time by myself traveling the world. So I know it's not always possible, but it's just a decision that you make. And you just say, hey, I'm going to stand up. I'm going to walk out the door and I'm going to get out there. It's really that simple or that difficult as the case may be. But I find that if I have a friend or my husband, someone comes alongside and says, hey, let's go do that. Even if initially I'm like, hey, then they persuade me to do it and it's fun. So I think my advice would be get a little bit of a fitness cohort in crime, get them to come alongside you and encourage you to do that. It, that works the best for me. Left up to just entirely myself. That's a whole other <laughs> story. Well, that's great advice, actually, because, yeah, it's fitness or just so many things really can be very difficult to just do on your own. And just having that other person to be your accountability partner or Mm -hmm. be that little bit of extra encouragement to get your butt out the door can be huge. And I I can't remember where I heard it, but I I heard something recently that just based on human psychology studies, it, it just, it shows that we are so much less likely to be willing to let somebody else down than let ourselves down. Oh, and so that's Ooh, exactly that's, that's true. true. So that's yeah, true. It, it is. You think about it. Two, one for community. Yeah, a hundred percent. Wow, that's so true. And yeah, if you can find somebody to do these activities or things like that, if you need right. that type of encouragement, that's huge. That can be the changing, the pivotal moment there, and getting active. Or even if you don't have anybody, I seriously have done this. I've been out walking or doing something. I see somebody else who's doing it in my neighborhood often. Sure. I don't even know. They'd be like, hey, do you want to do yeah. this together? Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. All of life. I need to get sense. better at that because I just, I don't know. I'm like an introvert when it comes to that. So I'm like, I'm mm. going to talk to them. So I need to get, I recently met some of my neighbors and it's a really good feel of, you know, how back in the day you would know your neighbors, right? You would talk right. and they would bring stuff to you. You bring stuff to them. And so that's kind of like how my neighborhood is. And I really like it because one of them will come over. Like, for example, I mentioned to my neighbor the other day that I was interested in kayaking and just doing that in the evenings. And right. Came over yesterday and she brought me a kayaking book. She kayaks. And so it's just I need to really just be better at that because I know I would meet so much, many more people and gain those relationships. That's really good advice. Okay, yeah. Anna, I'm going to hold you accountable. Yeah. Next time I see you, when you're asking me about the skiing or the surfing or whatever it is, I'm going to ask you if you've stepped out in that. It's so easy just to... The surfing, yeah, I have to go to somewhere that you can surf. But right. I've been telling my husband I really want to go to Hawaii. So now I'm like, I said on the podcast that I have to go. So like, now I have to go. go. It's out there. Everyone, you heard it here. Brenna is going to Hawaii. (laughs) Right on. 2026. (laughs) Now I'm kidding. Big Uh, Island. Big Island. Big Island. (laughs) Actually, that is another place on my bucket list too. Yeah. Is. So uh, the other thing, or just jumping back to just the outdoorsy thing, because again, I love the outdoors and I think it's, like, I think it's one of the best avenues for finding fitness, mm-hmm. not only for the physical aspect, but for the mental aspect. And to me, well, I, again, on two points. So one is that, again, it's scientifically proven that being in nature boosts your mood. That's right. right. Yes. That's- it does. You have true, Kale. So depression. true. And for me, and I'm sure for us, but coming from a background of fate, to me, that just makes perfect sense. Right. God gives us this beautiful earth to enjoy. And when I, when I go for a walk, lately I've been thinking about this a lot too. When I go for a walk, even just in my community, gated community, whatever, there's not a ton of nature, but there's trees and stuff like that. Right. I just look at like the way that the world is laid out in just the colors of nature, the green. Yeah. It's outrageously gorgeous. The colors of flowers, not only gorgeous, but it, everything goes together perfectly. Yes. It's it's amazing. And those colors are green is a very calming color, very calming color. It's just 
God has created nature with a purpose. And it's, right. it's no coincidence that being out in nature can make you feel better, make you want to be active. And right. Enjoy it. So it's just, like I said, it's something that I've just been thinking about on the walks that I do just in my little community here a lot. Trying I to mention this. For things. I mentioned this in another podcast, but what I do is I think I try to go in the easing sound that it's warmer. I can go in at the end of the day. I'm like thinking about some something that somebody said that made me upset or like just so many tasks. And then I go out and I start walking. I feel better. But what I've been making myself do is say three things that I'm grateful for. So I've turned that into talking to God. So I'm like, I'm thankful for the health that you've given me where I can actually go out and walk. I'm thankful right. for this beautiful day. I'm thankful for, I don't know. Something just thinking of the different things, and it's almost so you're the meditative things that I'm talking about. You're also right. saying what you're thankful for, but also having that moment with God. And then before you know it, like after that, whatever that person said that upset you, it, it doesn't matter. In the grand scheme of things, it doesn't matter. So, Dale, I'm so I don't know if you've been doing it, but I did challenge you to do those three grateful things. So when you're in your neighborhood walking, yeah, that's right. exactly part of what I'm doing there. Yeah, so I, I agree 100. percent So. That's something that I've been trying to focus on more. Grateful, being grateful. Yeah, because it is, uh, let's just say it's hard sometimes, yeah, especially when you're yes. doing so many things, you're distracted right. and you've got right. all these things on. And again, just I think in the Western world, the way that we're, we are a consumerist society and it's very easy to let that be your focus of things and right. not be grateful for what you have. Some so, days it's harder than others. Like some days you're just really just a bad day and Sometimes you can just get out. I'm thankful for my dogs. I'm thankful for food on the table. There's always something to be thankful for. And I think that just wellness outside in general helps with that. Right. Yeah. I think so too. I think it's perspective. It's just a really good view, not only on creation and how it draws our mind and our hearts to the creator, but just perspective. It's just a simple shift of perspective that changes a lot of other things in our body chemistry and everything else. It's very powerful. And it's, that's why I know destinations, destination vacations are so popular because people just, they need to unplug. They need to get away from all of that stuff and just be a part of something that requires nothing of them for the mm -hmm. most part, which is a tree, a rock, a trail, the sky, the river. And I think that's burdens that we lay down outside yeah. when we see beautiful nature. It's really powerful. Yeah. No, hundred percent, hundred percent. And I know you mentioned earlier that with, with the mountain biking, you're, you're more into the technical trails. So yes. you've been, so you're a pretty good mountain biker then. Is it downhill biking? That no, it's not downhill. Cause I want to live. <laughs> yes, I really, that's pretty I really like my limbs. And I'm, I don't like anything that's a huge adrenaline rush. Like I don't need to drop, jump off of perfectly good bridges or out of planes that are still functional. So for me, I just, the technical stuff, I love it for a few reasons. One is because it's my personal best. I do something and I know, man, oh, I finally conquered that section. Or I got up the courage to go over that bridge. And why in the world is it so high and narrow and windy? It's really a good way to challenge myself. Right. And then my husband, who has way better skills as a mountain biker, he's able to go on those same skills and challenge himself in such a different way. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's like with business. There's this crossover. It's kale. You've done all this stuff in business and you've been so successful and you're on this steeper, more technical trail than I am. And then I'm doing on my own little path and journey here and you compete against you and I compete against me and, and we're both happy because we're still able to move forward in the journey that we're on. And I think a lot of nature is like that with hiking trails and stuff where there's so many parallels to relationships and other things that we're involved in that you just think, oh, okay. And that's okay. It's all right that my husband's a radical, amazing mountain bike rider and I'm marginal. <laughs> like when you go to these conferences, somebody's like, I've got 30 properties and you're like, oh, 
okay, I'm nowhere near that, nor probably do I want to be, but it's, and that's okay because I'm not trying to, I think so many people will go to these and then they'll get overwhelmed and be like, I yeah, can't do yeah. that. It's too much. And it's okay. Then don't have one property. Try it out. If you don't like it, then it's fine. It's like you want. And so I like that you say, I'm on my own journey. And so are you. It may, it may be similar, but we are also different people and with different goals. And now you mentioned you and your husband, you do these, these activities together. You do them mostly together or? No, we do. We're, we're one of those couples. <laughs> we love to do stuff together. Awesome. I really, I'm so grateful that we really love that. I know some couples are like, get out of my way. They like to do stuff separate. We actually know a couple who vacation separately. They really love each other, but wow. that works for them. <laughs> yeah. But we do it all together. And it's super fun to do something like that. And then to have him encourage me. Last time we went out mountain bike riding, the first part of it, usually my first go in the season, sometimes <laughs> I get really nervous. And then I wasn't having a good time because I got too nervous. So he really encouraged me. And then I just thought, okay, forget it. I'm not going to be like that anymore. And then I got up to speed to how I usually am. But just having him encourage me or making a section I usually don't make, he's like, right on, honey. And I was like, no well, one else like your cares. your best friend. <laughs> it's like your best friend. It's awesome that you can have that in your marriage. So I like that. I'm so grateful that we both really love the same things. Genuinely, neither one of us is faking it. So it's really, oh. he's brought so much adventure into my life, which I also love. Because yeah. without him, I wouldn't ski or mountain bike ride. And yeah. I love it. That's wonderful. I guess what, what type of bike do you have? I actually have a Kona. Oh, hmm. the suspension or? Yes. Art? Yeah. Dual suspension. Right. Yeah. I actually think that it should be illegal to have a, a bike like that pretty much pedals up the hills for you. <laughs> <laughs> My old bike, the difference, okay, I'll just tell you what a difference is between major nice equipment and not such nice equipment is I wouldn't be able to make it up this really steep incline. And then I got my new bike and I was like, ooh, this is nice. Fun, fun, fun bike. And I can't even tell you how much fun. Sometimes we stop and I go, it's so much fun. Oh, do you smell that? Oh, look at that. Look at that. It's just this whole experience, the right. smells, the sights, the excitement, the adrenaline, and increasing my skill. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. I, so I do, I did, I need to get back into it because it's been a few years, okay. uh, but there was a period even down here in South Florida, there's surprisingly some very technical trails. They're all man-built, but oh. uh, there are some mountain bike parks down here that are quite technical. Um, oh. There was a period of probably two, three years where I was doing the mountain biking quite a bit. I need to get back into it, but uh, yeah, it was, it was, I liked it for the workout, the exercise, uh, again, just another way to, to get outside, get some fresh air for a while, just like with that type of thing, mountain biking or running, or you get that kind of runner's high at the end when you're done right. and you feel really good. And it was, it was fun. So I need to come to Whistler. You can use my bike. <laughs> I, I, I do my bike. I need to get out there. Oh my goodness. It's so gorgeous. If you did that, I can tell you this. When I was in Arizona, I was like, oh, I'm new to mountain biking. And I'm like, oh, no, this is an advanced trail. You can't do it. <laughs> and it was so easy. And I said, I think you kept telling me I couldn't do it. But as soon as you tell me I can't do it, I'm already like, um, watch me. <laughs> and so I went on it though. And it was so easy. And then I said, actually, that wasn't really, was that an advanced trail? And he's like, where do you usually ride? And I said, Whistler. And he goes, oh. So, oh. like, and oh. it's really like fun. I do sometimes walk my bike instead of ride it. There's always those portions. It I love and, it. And the only, the one time that I've been downhill biking was out in, out in Colorado, winter. Park. It's like the base of the mountain. The base is at 11,000 feet. And uh, oh my, my goodness. I'm from zero. See, yeah, people. exactly. <laughs> below, below zero, below some, zero. In some parts. <laughs> and uh, so I went out there, rented a bike. And I, like I said, I, I was doing the mountain biking, quote unquote, cross country biking at the right. time. Never done mountain or downhill. And I didn't do jumps and that type of stuff. And whatever. I stayed on the easier trails, which were still pretty challenging. And I did a few runs and I was feeling good. And 
So getting a little, a little confident and <laughs> all right, maybe I'll go a little faster and uh, you have to wear the gear, like the helmet and the, yeah, the neck snapper. And then all, yeah, all this, you have to wear all that stuff. And I'm thankful for that <laughs> because <laughs> then of course I had a terrible wipeout <gasps> and you know, I just, and I was wearing a camel back, one of those yes. uh, things with the water reservoirs and uh, wiped out and it knocked the breath out of me. So I'm just, I'm on the ground, like s screeching, trying to breathe. <laughs> Wimper, <laughs> and I see this just like puddle of liquid under underneath me and it's spreading. And I'm just thinking, I'm like, oh my gosh, did I'm I bleed to this? Like, oh. <laughs> and uh, thankfully, whatever, I catch my breath and get up and realize that it just it it ruptured the the water bladder. Pad. Yeah, <laughs> water bladder. But uh, needless to say, I think that was my last run. <laughs> the good lesson to learn is the moment that you feel like you're like I'm doing good, I look good, is yeah. when you. Just, when you fall. <laughs> crap. Yeah, like that's yeah. the moment. But it was beautiful. It was fun for the time being. <laughs> yeah. I love that. You would love it. Yeah. Oh yeah. You the problem is though, when you come here, I almost guarantee no, you'll be leave. like, I'm going back. Yeah. I'm going back. Yeah. Because it's that kind of place. It's just phenomenal. I don't know. Oh, people awesome. people ask, is that good? I was Googling something. Is Whistler really worth the hype? <laughs> yes. Yes. There you go, people. <laughs> if you're an outdoors person and you you really need to recharge in nature, it's one of my favorite places. Now they think now they can come stay with you. So. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so let's jump in. Let's talk about the fate here. We've touched on that a little bit throughout these other segments here, but just take us along on your faith journey. How did you come to know Christ? Did mm -hmm. you grow up in a Christian home? Mm -hmm. Did you come to Christ later in life? Or just how did that work with you? I did not grow up in a Christian home. In fact, my dad was really against the church. And he was very disappointed growing up by the church. And so for me, when I grew up, I just was also disappointed by the church. I had no reason to be, but I just adopted. We grew up in families mm -hmm. and they have certain feelings about things politically or religiously, whatever it is. And we just adopt those things. But uh, I was actually a uh, class president. So someone was inviting me to Bible study. And I admit to my shame that it was more of a political move. <laughs> I thought it's a large class and someone invited me. They keep inviting me. I should just go and be cooperative and inclusive and all that kind of stuff. So I went and I did not expect to give my heart or my life to Christ at all. In fact, I went really guarded. Yeah, that's right. What do you have to teach me? That's right. Like a typical teenager. I doubt if you can do it. And I was very surprised that the youth pastor that was speaking just started talking about Jesus Christ and what he did and how we all needed a savior. And I, as he started talking, he's very charismatic, by the way. He was at, on Dobson at the time. And I think at the time, they hadn't had that much response to a speaker on their show, except for him, Dewey Bertolini. Hey, Dewey. And so he was very charismatic and anointed. And I was just, I thought I was going to go there and Heckle the youth pastor and have the Holy Spirit heckled pretty much. And I realized that night that there really is a God and I have a choice to make. Hmm. Now, that choice took me about six months to make. And I was trying to figure out, first of all, what would that look at, like at home? I couldn't even imagine going home and telling my dad of all people, hey, you know those people that you... <laughs> are so upset with, I'm going to become one of them. I'm going to start the church. And the other part of that was one of the reasons my dad was so disappointed is because a lot of what a lot of people say that their gripe is against the church is it's full of what? <laughs> Hypocrites. Right. Hypocrites. Yep. So it's also felt the weight on my shoulders of if this is real, and I do this, and I commit my life to Christ, I never, ever want my dad to be able to point to me and say, you're the reason I don't go to right. church. Yeah. 
Now I was 17 and that was quite a burden for a girl who would be sent to her room and snuck out the window. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was probably the most rebellious kid in my family and full of a lot of vigor and vim and <laughs> just gave as good as I got. Just my biggest saying to my siblings, you're not the boss of me. I'm going to do what I want to do. But so I did commit. Like I said, it took me about six months to figure out what does this look like? The one of the pastor's wives in the church took me under her belt and mentored me for seven years and just poured into me. And she was the one who said, you'd make a really good teacher. Hmm. And so she plugged me into one of the ministries there with the the kids. They called it day camp. We'd take care of the kids in the summer, would take them out and do all these wonderful things. I drove the bus at the day camp. I was a bus driver. And learned within the context of that pastor's family what it looks like to be like Christ and love like Christ and not try to cover things up and not try to not deal with difficult issues. But what does it really look like to be in step with the Spirit and display the fruit of the spirit, not just talk about love, joy, peace, and patience and kindness and those things. What does it look like to really do that? That is so awesome that you had a mentor. It's because, heck, I feel like I could still use a mentor. I feel like any of us could still use a mentor because we always get our head. And I remember, similar to you when I was young, asking Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. And I thought, oh my gosh, I did it, but now I have to be absolutely perfect. I can't say it all. And so it was hard for me when I was younger because I did this or I smarted off to my mom and that's not right. Or I told the teacher I was sick and couldn't take the test. Things like that. And I wish I had somebody at a young age that would be like, that's not what it all is about because there are, and I'm just going to be blatantly honest, there are hypocrites out there. There are people that take some things from the Bible and say that it's true in fact, and then some things they'll ignore. and it's maybe it's just because they need a mentor, but I think that's the reason, like the bad rep that people get, because a lot of us are just trying to understand the Bible verses and stuff, stories in Sunday school or church, and it doesn't go any further than that. And yeah, in your all of your free time that you have, and I'm being sarcastic, you should try to maybe you can mentor somebody. I don't know. Yeah. I think it is possible. And I did learn from my mentor, Stephanie, she said two things to me that always, she said more than two, but that always stuck with me. One was that no matter, even though she was mentoring me, she said like, she should always as a Christian have someone that she's encouraging in Christ. And she even told me, you're a new Christian, but don't think that gets you out of that, that you should be encouraging people too. And so now I can honestly say from that moment in hearing what she said, and that's the way it's supposed to look, that I do that. I don't do that because I'm perfect and have all the answers, or I know what's going on in life, or I'm all that, because I'm certainly not. But encouragement is such a powerful thing, and words can build. Words bring life and hope, and words heal. And when we don't engage with someone to encourage, we're taking ourselves out of that beautiful process that Christ intended for us to experience, Mm. that it would be reciprocal and that it would really speak life into someone's heart and soul. And I really, so Steph, I don't know if you're out there, if you're (laughs) watching, thank you. I really what she did for me, showing me that it's not about being perfect, like you were saying, Brenna. It's yeah. not about not having hiccups and stuff. When I, my whole life blew up in Hawaii, people weren't really interested that your life is perfect and that you're tiptoeing through the tulips. I connected the most with people when I got up in front of my church and told what was going on. And people were like, oh, I like you so much better now. Yes. Yes. I thought you were perfect and I couldn't come up to you and talk. 
yeah. because the church for so many generations, so I have to say, <laughs> new generations are in the church and none of us buys into that. We all know that doesn't work. We don't want any part of it. We don't want trying to make things look good. And often what I say is at a time in my life, and I was like, my life sucks. But don't let that change your opinion about God. Yeah. It's painting a rainbow. My life sucks. <laughs> yeah. And people don't, they, they don't really give a rip about that. People want authenticity. If you're struggling, people want to hear it. If you don't have the answers, people want to hear it. I've written a devotion somewhere about being broken. And I think by myself or you or Kale or anybody, we are broken by design, but we are less broken with having faith in Jesus and God. And I think it maybe like even like fitness, like a diet. If I'm coaching somebody in that, then it makes me feel like I need to be better on my diet. If I'm telling them something, I need to walk. And so maybe it's like picking somebody to have that buddy with. Like you said, you want to go walk together or you want to go do this together. Maybe you say, okay, Tail, have you read your devotion yet today? What was yours about? What would you like about it? And I think that's the cool reason why we tried to create this podcast and the Facebook because we all can't meet in person. It's a virtual world now. Right. And you can get so lost. But the fact that we are all broken, we're just less broken with God in our lives. And let's help you to be less broken as well. Yeah. hundred percent. And just going back to what you were saying in regards to the pressure of being perfect. And I think that is a very real thing and a very, yeah, a very big detriment to Christianity, not only for Christians, but for non-Christians as well, like we were talking mm -hmm. about. And to me, it just, it's, it spawns from the father of lies himself. It telling us that you're not good enough. You think you're a Christian? You think you can be a Christian? Do you deserve that? Mm. Look what you've done. Look right. who you are. Right. All right. that kind of talk, that, that's, that comes from Satan. Right. But we let him in. And once he gets that foothold, man, is it hard to get him out. And so right. having a mentor having people that you can speak to about your faith that you can partner up with to encourage each other. That's why it's so important. And me, I need to do a better job of that too. And lately we've been trying to connect with some people within our church. Oh, you know, good. Yeah. Because we desperately need it. We all do. Iron sharpens iron. That's right. And, uh, but it is very hard to be authentic and be open because no matter what, I mean, you hear the thing you put on your church face. Oh, it's everybody. You go to church and you're about A hundred percent. When you might have just been arguing and yelling at each other the entire <laughs> drive over there. And, and, oh, <laughs> me and my husband have done that. We've yeah, done that. We have oh. been yelling at each other in the car. And then we get out <laughs> and it's like, hello. Yeah. We are praying the whole way over here. Like, it's just, I don't know what that facade is. Is it because we, I don't know what it is. I, 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 think, I don't know. Yeah. I think it is just still that. I mean, that perception that we have to, as a Christian, we have to present ourselves in a certain way, which again, I think it has more of a detriment to all of us. than. And see, that's the problem because if every single one of us does that, and then we're just saying, I'm just going to make it look good and we're not authentic, then we're stopping the rest of the church from doing that too. Right. Yep. So the other part of that is this. So if you're listening to this right now, I just want to say, not everybody's your best friend. You don't have to let everybody in mm -hmm. and be transparent with them. But what I always do is pray, especially if I'm at a new church, a new fellowship, I say, hey, God, help me connect with just one person here who maybe I can be a prayer buddy with or encourage or something like that. Help me do it and help it be organic. It's not like, hey, how you doing? First day of church, we you my friend? <laughs> yeah. That's creepy. Everybody's like, no, there's this nobody sitting around me. So I think that's it. There's you guard your heart unless it's somebody who is safe. Yeah. And then you share at a particular level and allow them to encourage you. Yeah. But I also think it's good to show up and say, hey, it's been a rough week, man. It's, it's been crazy. It's been disappointing. I, I was telling my husband, talking about the fruit of the spirit. And saying, my biggest challenge every single day is, especially with, you get comfortable in a marriage. Tell me, I've gotten couple, comfortable in my marriage. <laughs> and so 
it's really easy for me to excuse when I am under stress and in particular, a nasty tone of voice or a bad level of patience or responding, not responding, but more reacting. And so every day I do a little check. Mm. Am I showing up well in my own home? Yeah. Look, if I treat you guys with kindness here and I can speak kindly to you and I can be patient as the day is done, my husband deserves that every day. And my confession is last week I had to say, oh, I, I said sorry a few times. I'm so sorry for I gave you that tone of voice because you don't deserve that. I don't want to be that kind of wife. I don't want to be that kind of partner. Mm. And, but then other couples I've done that at church when I've said something wrong. And I know people are like this, like they're listening. And it shows an ugly side of me. But at the same time, other people go, hey, look, even in church, it's okay to say, I'm so sorry that I did. Not that you want to air everything and not everything is public. My husband's very private. But I think it's always the right time to make amends and to put everything aside and say, not my best moment. Please forgive me. You don't deserve to be talked to that way. I'm under stress, but that's no excuse for me to respond like that. And I just don't want to be like that anymore because I want to extend grace to you first. Anybody in my home, I extend it first. And then everybody else gets grace instead of, I'm going to extend grace and loveliness to everybody else outside my home. And all you guys get Yep. Trash pickings. Yeah, exactly. Isn't that the way it goes, though? With me, it it has been. <laughs> it's, it's the close. When my grandma started getting Alzheimer's, my aunt was the closest one to her. And so her daughter, she would go and check on her all the time. And my grandmother was the meanest to my aunt. Oh, but yeah. it's because they were, before her mind was going, they were the closest. Yeah. And I often see, no matter if you're losing your mind or not, you often show that unkindness to the person that you're closest to because you've put up this like facade so long that you're finally like letting it go and you have nothing left over. And so I can understand that's where I feel like it comes from. And I try to watch that and I try to then not put up some kind of wall that like I'm not a person, the person that I'm showing you. And I feel like that with social media, everybody has to feel like they have to look perfect, yeah. hey, right. perfect and not be able to show, you know what, ahead of our day, you know what? My yeah. husband and I, it's not always rainbows and sparkles do have our disagreements. And I feel like if more people would just admit it, like it would become, right. normal. it would become normalized. So I feel like hopefully we can get that out in this podcast and be like, it's okay not to be okay. Done. Yeah. So if yeah. we three start, it can be a movement. There we go. I'm going to post and be like, we'll be my husband and I have a fight today. He would be like, oh, I need to read this. <laughs> and that's the thing. Do we all think that there's not conflict or conflict resolution? It's not, it's like a business adventure. It's not how you entered it or you get out of it or whatever. The bottom line is, how were things resolved? What did you learn for, from it? And how are you moving forward? It is never, ever about the bad moment. Right. We all, I think sometimes there's a tendency to make it about the bad moment, but it's really about, and they say this is trite, it's about the journey. But it really is like, what do we do with those moments afterwards? How do we rally? So I think the thing going forward in the church that I would love to see is that we all just say, yep, sometimes we have really bad days. I don't like the way I responded there and I'm going to do better next time and just make that a part of the conversation instead of all the smiles and roses right. and stuff. But what do you do? Get up on the microphone. Hi, everybody at church. We had a big argument and I just want to let you know. Okay. Hi, I'm Laura. Hi, Laura. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Bad conflict resoluter. <laughs> yeah. We just have to be real and we have to allow ourselves. When I was going through literal hell and people saw my life, what can I say? It's inauthentic to say, oh, my life is so great. It's right. great. And that's, and it's the imperfections that not only allow people to relate to us more, we all have our problems, that's right. Right? but it's also those imperfections that God is able to use the most. 
and bring glory to his name. Yes, that's for sure. Because again, when Jesus was walking on this earth, he was not spending time with the quote unquote perfect people. Right. He was spending time with the sick, the mm -hmm. poor, the sinners, the people who needed him the most. Right. And he used those same people. And I think back to Paul a lot, the apostle Paul, he's such a great example for so many reasons. When he was defending himself as an apostle against people attacking him and saying, you did this, you were this guy. He doesn't say, no, I wasn't. He goes back and he lists. Yeah, I was this. Yeah, I, I did I, this. <laughs> but that's not who I am now. Christ came, Christ transformed me. This mm -hmm. is who I am now. And that's a powerful statement. And that's something that I think we can all try to learn from, myself certainly included, that <clears throat> we don't need to be perfect. In fact, we can't be perfect. No. God uses the brokenness in us to help others and bring glory to his name. And we should embrace that. Very true. Here, here. I can be the church. <laughs> so it's true. Freedom to be imperfect. Yeah. I think and the same what is uh, perfectly imperfect. Perfect. Right. But it's not easy. It is not easy. And that's why that's why we are where we are. That's right. <laughs> Just be authentic. Yeah. Yes. We do need to get to the end here. Really want to. We are winding this down for the last two hours. I yeah. <laughs> we'll be winding it down again for the next hour. <laughs> I know. People, if it was church, you would start hearing people's keys rattle. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta go. <laughs> Brenna's starting to ask, what's for lunch? Sure. So. Yeah, exactly. I wouldn't hear the keys because the pews around me are vacant. No, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah they, <laughs> so we do just want to get a couple, maybe a couple closing questions in here. Before oh, okay. We, we wrap it up here. Would you like to ask the questions in threes just because it tends to help us dive deeper into things? But uh, can you think of three actionable or practical tips on any of these areas that we've talked about that you'd like to share with our audience? Ooh, actionable tips. Yes. My biggest actionable tip right now is we all know that time is money and that I'm a big advocate of systems equals freedom. So to that end, I'm currently working on three ways to do that, which is make sure I have five-star guest communication which means it's automated. I'm also making sure that I get my tech stack in place, which is dynamic pricing, property management system, guest verification, all of that. And then the last thing is develop a set of standard operating procedures. So that is my three-step tip to how to make your short-term rental <laughs> time effective and efficient and Claw back your freedom. Yeah, Systems right. equal freedom. Look at that. That's a good PSA right there. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much, Laura. Oh, wait. I'm sorry. Brenna, I always forget. Brenna. <laughs> what is your favorite <laughs> pizza that you've ever had? Like, where is it at and why? Favorite pizza I've ever had? My favorite piece I ever had was at my friend Gil and Lori's house on the island of Oahu. They made the pizza. They brought the pizza oven from Italy on a trip of theirs. And I was like, oh, it can't be any different. Like pizza's pizza. Come on. We don't need hoity patoity pizza. That pizza was so different. It right. was yum, fresh basil and pesto and mozzarella. And I was in Italian heaven. I don't know what happened with those bricks from Italy, but whatever, it was perfection. Wow. Yeah. Do you still, are you still in contact with them? <laughs> Brenna wants to know what's... I need the recipe. <laughs> I honestly, like I did, I created a note thing in my phone, the, the pizzas. And so everybody like, we, we do a podcast with, but I write down the pizza that they said. So I'm like, I would love that recipe. But I don't have the Italian stone thing, but I've seen, I've looked at stone pizza makers and stuff like that. Yes, I am not currently in contact with them because I think they moved from that place and they were downsizing. But if I come across any fantastic pizza recipe, it's going to be forwarded to you immediately, Brenna. <laughs> That's a hard one to top too, man. Yeah, it is. That sounds awesome. Pizza from it was, I was so surprised. I was like, come on now. How much that pizza cost? <laughs> oh, man. There we go. <laughs> 
<laughs> that was the best twenty thousand dollar pizza I ever ate. Oh my god! I'm not say I'd say I wouldn't pay. No, it was monthly installments. I do not blame them. I'm a foodie, and I do. After I ate it, they made a believer of me. <laughs> yeah. There we go. That was the challenges out. If anyone can top that pizza right there. So. <laughs> Okie dokie. With that, we're going to end the show. But this has been very interesting. And I appreciate all the insights, Laura. It's been a pleasure. And ladies and gentlemen, we will see you on our next episode. Yep. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thanks, Kale and Brenna. Thank you.